Great. Welcome everyone. We are just going to take a few seconds here to let everyone who was in the waiting room enter and we'll begin. Okay, welcome to our uh, NIEHS funded Environmental Health Sciences Core Center, UK CARES, here in, at the University of Kentucky, um, our, our webinar series. Uh, I'm Erin Haynes, Deputy Director of the Center. Ellen Hahn is um, our, our fantastic leader. Um, he's leading the charge with UK CARES, and I'm happy to and welcome you to this seminar series. Um, and today, I, I'm over the moon excited to have Dr. Rima Habre join us today. Um, she is an associate professor um, at the University of Southern California um, in the field of environmental health and spatial sciences. I've seen Rima give fantastic talks. Her, her air quality um, assessment and spatial analysis is on the cutting edge. Um, and I would, I'm excited to have us here at UK experience her work um, and see her and what um, her actions, you know, her research in action. Um, so we will take questions. If you would like to put them in the chat, I know they'll, they'll pop up. You can put them in the chat and we'll have her answer them at the end. So welcome to the seminar and uh, Dr. Havre, welcome. And we're so glad to have you. And you just are on mute, so we'll unmute you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Haynes. And um, thank you all for being here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I was sharing right before we started that today is Internet Issues Day. So please do interrupt me if you can't hear me, and hopefully everything will go smoothly. I really appreciate the time an invitation to be here with you all. I'm going to talk about personalizing air pollution exposure science to advance precision environmental health. And I feel like you guys, um, you know, are an awesome crowd and already know a lot about what I'm going to talk about. So hopefully this will be an interesting overview and I'm always happy to have discussions afterwards and elaborate on anything of interest. So as many of you, of course, know, air pollution is one of the largest environmental risk factors in the global burden of disease work. Usually the WHO in that work is kind of considering outdoor air pollution and what is termed household air pollution. That is not everything under the indoor air pollution sort of umbrella, but it's a very important type of exposure. Of course, we have a lot of systemic inequities and discrimination in policies and laws over time that have led to persistent environmental health disparities where certain groups could be way more disproportionately exposed to contaminants, but also at higher risk of their adverse effects. And we of course know that climate change is very much worsening and speeding up some of these um, adverse exposures, especially when it comes to air quality and wildfires and it's also widening existing health disparities, and that's often called the climate gap. And when we think about personal exposure, we mean what we as humans are breathing in our kind of breathing space, right? That is a very complex mix that comes from very different sources. You know, the components and the chemistry and the kind of toxicological properties of it could be very different depending on what's in that mixture. But also personal exposure is highly dependent on what we're doing, where we spend our time, what's going on outside and inside our homes. And these factors are often ignored, not on purpose, of course, in health studies, but just because they're more difficult, perhaps to get an accurate handle on. And that introduces exposure measurement error in our studies. And so of course that you know, is a problem because it can weaken our ability to see effects when they actually exist. And so what I'm hoping to show you today is how recent advances in sort of these personalized um, exposure methodologies from measurements to modeling uh, to wearables and GPS tracking and so on are really advancing our ability to do more personalized, individualized precision environmental health studies. And hopefully from that, we can design more targeted and informed interventions and try to make a dent to reduce health disparities. <clears throat> 
So this is the background motivation of my talk today. And just to show you the kind of the, the scale of the problem that I'm talking about, right? And I'm sorry, I'm not, I can't pay attention to the chat at the same time. So again, please interrupt me anytime. Um, so here on the left in this map, you see uh, these blue dots are a typical GPS track of a participant living in LA over a few days, right? So you can right away see the variety and diversity of all the different places people spend time in. However, in a typical health study, usually we're determining where a person lives, let's say this is it, we draw some kind of buffer around that and we try to assess environmental exposures in that buffer with the assumption that of course that is representing what people are truly exposed to. The only problem with that is that people don't usually spend all their time outside or on the rooftops of their homes, let's say. And if we look at actual personal monitoring data where we put these air quality sensors on actual people right near the breathing zone, and you compare what we are modeling at this residential outdoor or ambient level in terms of PM 2.5 air pollution, so that's particulate matter. So if you look at this kind of plot here, the correlation of that outdoor air pollution with what we're measuring in the personal breathing space is really very low. Even if you exclude influential days, and this is from around 609 person days of personal monitoring data in pregnant women in LA, we still see that that relationship is really sort of terrible. Of course, it doesn't mean that outdoor air pollution is not contributing at all to personal exposure. It does to some extent, but it's not everything that we are exposed to, right? And that's what I'm really hoping to show you today. So what determines actual personal exposure? And so what we mean again is what are we breathing in our personal breathing zone right around where we are, at least externally for today's talk. So we as humans tend to spend a lot of time indoors, right, in different settings. COVID pandemic has definitely changed these patterns significantly, but the indoor environment has a lot of sources and sinks or removal mechanisms for air pollution. It's also very much in kind of communication with the outdoor environment. So things are always coming in and going out in terms of air pollution, perhaps diluting, perhaps the other way around. Where we live and where we spend our time can be in close proximity to or impacted by a lot of outdoor sources of pollution like specific point sources or line sources like roads and rails, for example, and traffic could be area sources, really depends on where you are. But we also have features in that built environment, for example, green space, that could in and of themselves be buffers or ways to remove pollution, so pollution from the air. They could also emit pollution sometimes, and depending on the contaminant, of course. And then you have this regional background ambient pollution that you could get over an area, you know, depending on where you are again. To add to all of this is that we don't just sit in our houses all day, again, pre-pandemic maybe, but we as humans move around a lot and we have our own mobility patterns, where we go, how much time we spend indoors, outdoors, in transit, et cetera. And so to really be able to understand what we're breathing in that zone, imagine how complex all these factors are to try to sort of get a handle on. So all this together means that total personal exposure roughly is composed of, or these sources contribute to it, indoor sources, things that are originating in our indoor spaces, outdoor sources, pollution that is originating outside, and what we call sort of personal activity or personal cloud related sources, meaning sometimes what we do ourselves could emit or lead to increased pollution levels, right? And so these are not exact percentages, they're just rough averages from the literature of what we commonly see and mostly for illustration today. So you see that a huge portion of our personal exposure is actually coming from indoor sources and indoor environments. And what we're often not super clearly describing or explaining, let's say, when we are doing an epi study looking at outdoor air pollution, is that what we're interested in or what we're trying to estimate is that fraction that you see here in blue of people's total personal exposure that is coming from outdoor sources or that is of outdoor origin. 
Why? Because of course we care about outdoor air pollution and it's regulated and we're trying to provide the science and the evidence to support regulations to be more health protective, of course, right? It doesn't mean that this question on the right, this sort of whole total personal exposure question is not interesting and not important. Both of these are very important questions, but just to highlight the difference is that when we're thinking about total personal exposure, we're often interested in this whole pie, right? And trying to understand all these things. The other thing to keep in mind is that these percentages can really vary a lot based on who you are, you know, your typical patterns, your life, et cetera. As such, the mixture or the composition of this total exposure could also be very different. So total personal exposure is not one thing, at least in the PM 2.5 for particulate matter realm, right? So how do we typically think about these things to try to study them and understand them? And I know you're all very familiar with this model, but just to lay down the conceptual framework for this. So let's say you might be interested in one or more particular sources of air pollution. These could be outdoor, could be indoor, could be personal, like we said. These will emit pollution that gets into the air and we measure concentrations usually, right? It could be concentrations of one chemical or more chemicals or pollutants. Then we try to do an exposure assessment in our study to relate those concentrations to how people are getting in contact with them as an exposure, right? And so that is what is a concentration right at the body boundary before people inhale it and it becomes a dose and then potentially leads to a health effect. And so in those exposure assessment approaches, we have a wide range of sort of tools and methods that we use ranging from population level to very individual level. And the more we move towards this individual level, the more we're gaining spatial temporal resolution usually in our assessments, the more we are incorporating information about time activity, mobility patterns, behaviors, and actual contexts that people live in and spend time in. The more personalization, of course, and most importantly, the lower measurement error in terms of really understanding true exposure, right? So all along this framework, we also think a lot about susceptibility factors and those could relate to various things. So it could be in an environmental health disparities framework, for example, it could be related to the neighborhood built environment and access to certain features and socioeconomic factors. Climate change, of course, is a special lens that we think about a lot in terms of susceptibility and exposures. And it could be related to the life course or the kind of the stage that a person is in in their life. And all of these factors, of course, operate at multiple different levels, both in space and in time. So what I'm hoping to do today is give you a, an overview from my work and my team's work of some of these approaches, starting from the population level and moving into the individual level. And so the specific context that I'll be working, uh, that I'll be talking about today is something I'm actually very interested in, um, you know, more recently, and that's thinking about climate change and wildfire exposures. So as you all know, wildfires are increasing a lot in frequency and in how intense they are and how long they go, right? They're not just, let's say, a West Coast kind of a problem because they're impacting all of the US and beyond. And climate change, you know, changes in land use, this increase in the area that we call the wildland urban interface, all of these are contributing. We know a lot about acute health effects of wildfires, let's say, or more than we know about chronic health effects. So that's one direction of interest. But some of the things that we think about when we're trying to study wildfire smoke exposure and its health impacts could be similar to how we think about air pollution in general, but there's also some nuance there, right? So wildfires in and of itself, of themselves, of course, are mixtures. They tend to not occur in isolation. So Car and I were just talking about sort of heat stress and extreme temperatures. There's ozone formation, there's ash, water-based exposures, etc. Of course, we have to think about the usual susceptibility factors and confounders, such as comorbidities, but also in the climate change realm, we think about urban heat islands, you know, neighborhoods where the ability to cool down temperatures is not the same as a more green or let's say 
blue neighborhoods and that affects people's exposures, of course, health disparities, and et cetera. The other really interesting angle for me in, you know, in thinking about wildfires is that people tend to really change their behaviors drastically, at least when they are aware that there is wildfire smoke or they're very close to a wildfire, right? And that probably depends on how much you're impacted. So you might relocate if you're really close or if you're kind of impacted by smoke, but not that close, you might seal up your home, run your air conditioner, stay inside a lot more, right? So all those factors are dramatically shifting when wildfires are occurring, it seems at least. That again, increases the potential for exposure management error. A little bit more specifically about sort of the complexities in wildfire smoke. Um, you know, the, the smoke itself is very complex in terms of the chemistry and what's in it. It's not just particles and ultrafines, it's PAHs, carbons, you know, ions, the benzene, benzoapyrene, etc. It really depends a lot on what is burning. So if it's more of a natural versus a man-made kind of fire, there's been lots of evidence recently about fires actually mobilizing some heavy metals that have been deposited into forests, for example. Fires or, or smoke plumes from wildfires actually undergo a lot of long range transport so they can start one place and travel long distances. And what happens, so you see this very nice kind of plot on the right here. This is one example of a fire that I believe started in kind of Western Canada and made its way down to New York City. So you see on the first day, the smoke is sort of very aloft vertically in the atmosphere. This is altitude. And as the days progress, it's getting more mixed down into the, the kind of the atmosphere and entering that mixing layer or the, you know, the ground level zone where people are actually exposed below the planetary boundary layer height. And so what that means is that when a wildfire is burning and smoke is being emitted, it could be very high up in the atmosphere or it could be sort of closer to ground. And we need to be able to distinguish those things to assess exposures accurately, right? There's also a lot of secondary formation of ozone and other organics and et cetera, et cetera. I'll try to be brief around these details, but again, I'm happy to talk more about them just for the sake of getting to the more personal stuff. But I want to show you a couple of examples of how we use remote sensing, so satellite data, machine learning, and low-cost sensor monitoring networks like the Purple Air network to build these highly spatial temporally resolved exposure models, at least of outdoor concentrations of PM 2.5 to try to tease apart those wildfire signals. And so on the left here, you see a very nice paper and model developed by Yu Gang Lu, who was one of my students and just defended, um, just graduated actually. So Yu Gang put this hourly 500 meter squared Created PM 2.5 model for Los Angeles, and he incorporated the Purple Air low cost network monitoring data into that. Of course, that has its own kind of considerations that I'll talk, that I'm happy to talk more about afterwards. On the right here, you see another example of a weekly one kilometer squared uh, spatial temporal model that we're building for all of California. And this is work led by my postdoc Leo Lee and in our echo center. And so here you see, this is sort of a little bit more complicated because we again incorporate remote sensing data and chemical transport model outputs and all sorts of geospatial inputs. But we specifically incorporated these dispersion smoke estimates of wildfires. And this piece is work that was done by our colleagues at Sonoma Technologies. And so what we did is we basically put in a term in the model that actually captures the contribution of PM 2.5 from wildfire smoke specifically. And you see on the right here, this is sort of the total predicted PM 2.5 concentration from our models. We were able to very much capture the impacts of wildfire smoke in space and in time. And so this model is actually for 10 years over California. There's a lot of kind of discussion now on, on how to use these estimates in health studies. But just to show you some of the 
patterns or trends we start to see when we are able to model exposures at that fine of a resolution, let's say. So this is from Yugang's hourly model in Los Angeles, and it's just really to show you sort of a, a visual of typical trends. So these are four hours of the day that we selected, and this is a random week that here on the left, and you can see sort of rush hour patterns in LA, et cetera. This would be a ra random weekend. This is the day when the Woolsey wildfire was happening and it was started, it started kind of right around here. And you see how drastically different that profile is and how wind dependent it is, right? And then this is 4th of July, just for kind of for fun, for comparison. And if you've ever seen these fireworks in action, actually you can very much track sort of visibility during the day until you get to this 11 p.m. time point. So this is just to show you how rich the data or the spatial and temporal gradients that we can see are from these types of approaches and using these types of models, right? The other example from the sort of the longer term modeling work that we're doing in, in our ECHOS project is from this model that we published for California for PM 2.5. So if we take these rasters, these surfaces that, again, our colleagues at Sonoma Tech generated, um, these are high speed model estimates of PM 2.5 coming from wildfires over this whole 10 year period. If we take the median level, because we want to get a sense of sort of chronic long term exposures. So if we were to look at the mean or the maximum, we might see where the biggest fires happened. Right, but those could have happened in a very short period of time relative to this 10 years. So we want to try to understand the chronic exposure patterns. And we summarize this median wildfire related PM 2.5 here on the left. And right away, you see a pattern that I was surprised to see at first, but it makes sense in a way because it really follows the topography of LA or California and sort of the mixing patterns of air pollution. So again, you see the valley and the sort of very urban part of LA having the highest chronic wildfire smoke exposure. If we overlay this on the right with the Cal Enviro screen, environmental justice screening score that we have here in California. So the darker neighborhoods or census tracts that you see here are what we might typically think of as environmental justice communities that need more investment, of course. We put these two surfaces together. And so these colors here on the map on the right are the wildfire smoke again at the air quality monitoring stations that we have overlaid with the census tracts. And right away, you start to see this pattern where the higher the Cal Enviro screen score or the more of an EJ community we're in, the higher the chronic wildfire related PM 2.5 exposure seems to be. Of course, this is a little bit biased by where the monitors are placed anyway, but this is kind of interesting preliminary data on the fact that environmental health disparities are also extending beyond what we typically think of as very local source impacts, let's say. And it's important from a climate sense. And so speaking of health disparities, I want to briefly introduce our Madre Center before I show you some of the personal monitoring work that we're doing in the center. And so Madres is really a pregnancy cohort. The center is led by doctors Carrie Breton and Tracy Bastain at USC, and I lead the Exposure Assessment Corps and Project 3 in the center. What we are doing is we're recruiting pregnant women from the heart of LA from four different clinic partners. And this map here shows you the darker colors are the neighborhoods where we're getting the highest recruitment from so far. This is a little bit lagging in time, but generally you see that most of our participants live in East LA, Boyle Heights, South Central, etc. But we have a good spread across LA. These neighborhoods are also predominantly Hispanic, as you see in the green color here, and African American in yellow. This is census data. And these pink boundaries show you those same neighborhoods. Not surprisingly, these are also neighborhoods that have been historically redlined. I'm sure you're all aware of the sort of legacy of discriminatory housing policies and lending policies that have led to sort of cities and 
neighborhoods looking the way they are now in terms of air pollution sources and toxic chemical exposures, et cetera. And so that's really our interest in Madres is to understand all of these environmental exposures together and social stressors that our participants experience to understand effects on maternal and child's health. But I want to specifically talk about wildfire smoke exposure and urban heat islands that we literally just started working on um, a couple of months ago with some new pilot funding. And so the last 10 years in California, not surprisingly, again, have seen the highest number of wildfires and the highest temperatures on record. And we know that wildfire smoke itself is associated with lower birth weights. Extreme temperatures and heat stress are also associated with low birth weight, sort of independently. And we're interested in understanding their joint effects on birth outcomes and growth outcomes in Madres. And another, again, kind of interesting angle is trying to understand, you know, measurement error in the context of wildfire and how well do these outdoor measures of wildfire smoke track with what people are personally exposed to in their breathing zone, right? So this map just shows you on the right how the Madras neighborhoods in pink again sort of cover a broad range of the urban heat island index. So some summary measures of the wildfire exposure um, kind of data or trends that we see in Madras so far. This again was a bit surprising to me, but I want I will use this opportunity to kind of show you how wide of a gradient there is in exposure. And you know, typically when we think about wildfires, we think of them as these kind of extreme rare events, but the reality we're living in now is very different than that. So this on the x-axis is calendar time. And you know, my team and I built these daily level residential timelines for all our participants. So we basically know where each participant lives on any given day, starting from the preconception period all the way to the last follow-up that we have. And that, of course, accounts for where they move, etc. And the pregnancy periods of these women, so the Y is just different individuals and every horizontal line is one person. And so the red here are the pregnancy periods of these women. So if you overlay that with CAL FIRE wildfire data that we have here in California, yes, the red is when there was an active wildfire in Southern California. And right away, you see there's a lot of overlap with all these pregnancy periods and when wildfires were burning. But if you also look at the number of wildfires burning at the same time, you see, again, there's a wide range and it could be anywhere from you know, none or one to 11 fires burning at the same time, just in Southern California. Similarly, if you look at the acres burned or the size of the wildfire, that is also very variable, uh, you know, with very small to very large fires at the same time. So hopefully this shows you the complexity of Kind of thinking about all these exposure metrics for wildfires and it's not as simple as you know it kind of turn on and off switch right so i was surprised to these to see these statistics again but what we're seeing is that madres women experienced on average 130.5 wildfire days during their pregnancy and that could range up to 211 days as a maximum and that's in 713 um, you know, babies and moms that we've looked at so far using this kind of wildfire data. So again, huge variability in, you know, all these wildfire exposure metrics during pregnancy. Some super pre preliminary data, again, this is still in pilot phase, um, but my wonderful postdoc Roxana Halili here and the team actually uh, have looked at the number of wildfire days during pregnancy, and we're starting to see significant effects with lower growth for gestational age at birth. And this is actually a big effect in about 700 babies. It's roughly equivalent to the mean growth for gestational age C-score. So we're currently pursuing this. Um, this is per standard deviation of number of wildfire days. But similarly on the right here, you see work from Carl Osharki, who's actually defending tomorrow. I'm very proud to say that he's done amazing work. Um, Carl has looked at personal PM 2.5 exposure on the x-axis here. I don't think you can see, okay, 
finally figured out how to show you my mouse. Um, Carlos looked at personal PM2.5 exposure here on the x-axis, which I'll talk about next in terms of how we measured it, and gestational age in weeks. And he stratified this. This is a very small sample size yet, um, but about to be expanded. He stratified this into sort of days when there was high wildfire smoke based on those surfaces that we modeled and whether the windows were closed or open versus days with low wildfire smoke. And right away, you see that there's a different relationship and more adverse potentially effects on days with high wildfire smoke and when the windows were open, meaning there's actually more potential for exposure versus the other days. Yisi Lu, who's also one of my wonderful postdocs, is doing work investigating the potential for exposure measurement error um, during wildfire scenarios. So I'll explain these plots. Here on the left-hand side, and I think I'm having a little bit of trouble with my mouse, but I'll figure it out, okay. On the left-hand side, you see, so here on the left, there's sort of the personal PM2.5 exposure that we've measured in the four quartiles of that. So if you're in the red group here, you're in the highest quartile of measured personal PM2.5 exposure. And on the right-hand side, there's that residential outdoor estimate that we estimate, you know, as we typically do in most of our studies and where that would classify you. So the difference in those red bars, when a wildfire that was at least 10,000 acres was burning in Southern California, compared to days when there wasn't a wildfire, that difference in the red bars is greater, right? So that indicates that these outdoor measures of wildfire could be even less representative of personal exposure when wildfires are burning compared to any other, any other day, um, you know, when you think about this in an air pollution context. And I should have said, these are outdoor measures of air pollution in general, right? Not just wildfires. And this holds true though, regardless of the size of the fire, right? So again, it kind of confirms what we think about in terms of potentially exposure averting behaviors happening at that time. Now that I've given you this overview of sort of the population level approaches, I wanna to get to the very personal individualized approaches in Madres that we work on. And I'm actually going to show you examples of two kind of styles or ways of doing this and share hopefully a little bit of what I've learned in doing this. There's the sort of classic approach or I call it the classic approach and that's stuff that I'll show you from what we're doing in Madres, but then there's also the novel informatics sort of wearable sensors, real-time data communication approach, which is work that we've done in the PRISM Center and continue to do. And so in the Madres study, I lead a couple of personal monitoring kind of efforts. Some of them are repeated over time in the first and the third trimester in the postpartum period. Others are just in the third trimester. And I'll show you examples of these right now. So in these studies, we use a variety of tools and sensors and methods. So for example, we're using this RTI microfilm to collect minute level personal PM2.5 concentrations in the breathing zone of these women over four days in the first trimester, third trimester, and the postpartum period. And in another design, we're using these sort of small pumps and personal impactors to collect particles on Teflon filters. And that allows us to do more detailed chemical speciation on the filters. Uh, although of course it doesn't allow us to see this minute level variation. So both of these setups I've designed in a way where we put them in a special purse that has a sampling tube. You can barely see it because it's black on this figure, but the inlet is right around here in the shoulder area. And we've had great success actually doing these. They're very complicated studies to implement, of course. I don't want to imply that it's easy. Um, but with all these designs, we also designed our own Madre's GPS app to collect 10 second level GPS data. And sometimes we deploy these EMA uh, or ecological momentary assessment surveys on phones. So I'm gonna hopefully not take too long, but just to show you examples of what we're doing with all this amazing GPS and personal PM 2.5 data. 
So Li Yi, who also just defended this year and has done an amazing job, he has published a paper showing how we can take these GPS tracks and look at activity spaces. So where are people actually spending their time and assess environmental exposures within them? And I'll show you examples. Yan Shu, who is also my wonderful PhD student who just defended again, I've had four of them this year, so don't be surprised when I keep saying this. Um, and she's starting as a postdoc with me this month. Yan has basically shown how different exposure assessment can be if you, let's say, draw the typical residential neighborhood kind of circle around where people live or look at the census track for any exposure of interest versus really incorporate activity space information. Meaning this is a person's GPS track and we can draw these polygons around where they've actually been. And we can even go a step further and assign greater weight to the locations where they've spent a lot more time. So you see this right away here and maybe here a little bit and give very little weight to places that they just happen to be kind of transiting through, right? So the hope, of course, is that all this is leading to more nuance and truly understanding what people are exposed to. We can go a step further and analyze the sequence of 10 second level GPS data to start to understand when are people staying in certain locations and when are they kind of commuting or having trips between them that connect them. And we can also classify or understand the context that they're in and the type of the trip that they're doing, if it's vehicular um, or pedestrian, let's say. And this paper actually got published. This is a, a mistake, sorry. But I'll show you more about this in a sec. So here on the left, you also see work from Lee. We take those state locations, we overlay them with land use data and building footprint data, and we can start to classify whether that point was, let's say, at a park, in a commercial location at what seems to be their home and whether that was indoor or outdoor within some error, of course. Wa Hao, who was my student, I wanna say two years ago she finished and is now a postdoc at Emory. She has also shown how we can use a lot of the smartphone sensor data embedded in our phones like sound level and speed and temperature and humidity and location accuracy to very accurately predict when people are moving across microenvironments. So for example, here you see in blue is indoor, they move to in transit, then outdoor, then indoor again, et cetera. And we are able to do this with very high accuracy. So why do we care about doing all this stuff, right? Some of the results or kind of patterns that we start to see and understand this is an example from Lee's work again and the paper he just published. We are seeing that in our Madre study in these pregnant women, they're spending probably what we would expect in terms of time at home, but they're only, so out of all the visits that they take on a, you know, during the time that we monitored them, only 2% of those were to parks and open spaces. So experiencing some kind of green space or rec really recreational kind of time. Um, and of all the trips that they did, 75% were vehicular and only 25% were walking trips. And if we look at where those trips started and ended, you see that most pedestrian trips are happening kind of between commercial and services locations. So you see those kind of blue dots. Very few at parks and open spaces again. And most of the vehicular trips in red seem to start or end at the home, you know, visiting commercial services or other locations, right? So this kind of nitty gritty level of detail is very rich. It's at the 10 second level. And now I'm going to show you how we can pair that with the sort of minute level personal PM 2.5 exposure data that we're collecting with those micrograms. And so this plot is just to show you how rich the exposure data is actually in the study. This is from about 60 something women, um, a repeated measures design again across the first third trimester and the postpartum period and across four days. It's roughly about a million data points. The goal is not to show you the actual levels of personal PM 2.5 exposure, but just to show you 
the immense variation in exposure at this level. And the different colors are just different people. So, you know, across people, but also within a person, right? So instead of just looking at PM 2.5 levels, we can actually analyze these time series and detect certain kinds of peaks that we know are characteristic of, let's say, primary combustion, where the levels could go up very quickly and then decay in a certain kind of shape. If we look at the differences you know, across the pregnancy and postpartum in these peak level exposures, we start to see significant increases over time where the early postpartum period actually has a lot more peaks compared to pregnancy. This difference was not visible when we were just looking at the average exposures, right? When we combine this minute level personal PM 2.5 exposure data, so that's what you see here on the left, with the GPS data on the right here, and the context that we classified, so these blue, red, kind of green dots, the purple here are the vehicular trips connecting these stays. Then we start to understand or see that most of the peak exposures or these kind of primary combustion related peaks are occurring in the home residential environment. And if we break that down even further, most of those are happening indoors in the home residential environment. Perhaps not surprising to people who are kind of very aware of how important the indoor environment is to our exposures, but just really nice to see it with actual data and to kind of demonstrate this point again, is that we spend most of our time indoors and there's quite a few different sources of pollution indoors. Now what Jan has done is she's actually taken those GPS tracks and she's done, she's assigned exposure to various different environmental kind of features within those GPS tracks. One of them, or a couple of them are NDVI or this greenness and vegetation measure from remote sensing and park area, et cetera. And she has looked at, and you know, access to roads and other things, right? But she's looked at how these different exposures in the activity space actually predict measured personal PM 2.5 exposure. And she's seeing significant effects where more greenness or more access to a park, greater park area within the actual activity space of a person where these women you know, actually spent time is significantly associated with lower personal PM 2.5 exposure in their breathing zone and the flip of that, the more there are primary roads and secondary roads within those activity spaces, there's a significant positive increase in personal PM 2.5 exposure. Again, perhaps not surprising, but really difficult to demonstrate this so directly with actual personal monitoring data. So this is very exciting work um, that's actually under review right now and hopefully will be published very soon. Jan has also taken those filters that we collect and we've analyzed for chemical information and she's done source apportionment analysis on these where basically we can start to see the major sources contributing to personal exposures in these women based on their chemical fingerprints. And what we're seeing is that secondhand smoking is contributing more than half of that personal PM 2.5 exposure in these pregnant women. So are a few other kind of typical sources that we might expect in our region. But the surprising thing is that in the study design, we actually really heavily tried to avoid measuring in, you know, with women or families who have active smokers in the home or might be extra exposed to secondhand smoke, let's say. So despite all our efforts, secondhand smoke is still a very prominent exposure and perhaps it's, it's so passive that, you know, pregnant women might not even be realizing that they're getting that much exposure. And that's something that CARD is also investigating further. CARD has also taken these personal PM 2.5 exposure measurements and looked at their association with birth weight. And while there's no real association with total personal PM 2.5 and birth weight, when you split this up or look at effect modification by different features that correlate with how much of that personal PM is coming from more indoor versus more outdoor sources. 
he starts to see significant interactions. So for example, in women who spent none or very little of the time indoors, meaning they spent more time outdoors, the effect of PM on birth weight seems to be more adverse. Similarly, people who have used the air conditioner or who have never used the air conditioner, you know, none of the time during that period that we monitored them, the effect of personal PM 2.5 was worse on birth weight. And that was the flip when they do use air conditioner, right? So it shows also how some things could be protective in that sense. Carl's paper also just got published actually and is available if anyone's interested. Um, I'm going to take this chance to very quickly mention that you know I had the honor this last year to work on this indoor chemistry study with the National Academies and with an amazing committee. The report just got published. So if you're interested in really kind of you know, uh, understanding more about the emerging science on indoor chemicals and the indoor environment and how it affects our exposures and health. Please look it up and I'm happy to tell you more. Um, finally, and I'll try to keep this very brief so we have time for questions. Another kind of overview of the more novel approaches to personal monitoring where we can actually be in the informatics space and the kind of the wireless real-time data transmission space. So this is work from the PRISM Center that I was very lucky again to work with um, Dr. Alex Bowie at UCLA and my colleagues there on kind of developing these tools, but also deploying them in kids who have asthma. So we developed this breeze kit, which is really composed of several different wearables and sensors and so it included you know, the first generation Airbeam low cost PM 2.5 sensor, the propeller health Bluetooth enabled inhalers, um, a smartwatch, a smartphone with EMA surveys, a peak flow meter, et cetera. All these devices communicate via Bluetooth in actual real time, meaning within seconds of when they're measuring, we're seeing and collecting the data. And of course, the really hard work is building this entire infrastructure on the back end. I won't get into the details because we don't have time, but if you're interested, please watch our YouTube seminar from a couple of years back. And this is also described in this paper. But so what these kinds of informatics systems allow us to do is gather very highly time-resolved and space-resolved data on a variety of health metrics and outcomes and exposures at the same time. So this plot again is super busy and I don't mean for it to show you actual levels of things, but just to show you how this was from the pilot that we deployed in kids who have asthma and monitored them for up to 14 days. We are collecting data on lung function outcomes, on inhaler use, medication use, on relative humidity, temperature, personal PM 2.5 exposure, heart rate, so many other things all in parallel at the same time at very high frequency. What that allows us to do is sort of move beyond the paradigm of just looking at between person differences in these relationships and how air pollution might affect asthma exacerbation risk in kids, for example. And we can now more and more do these within person studies, but also within day, very acute effect types of studies within a person, right? So if we have equally resolved or very highly resolved data that's collected continuously over a typical day on the health outcomes that we care about and on all the exposures that we care about in the environment and these contextual factors, we can start to look at associations at the you know, 15 minute to an hour range. And that's actually what we're doing right now. So we've deployed the system in a panel study of 40 kids who have asthma recruited from the UCLA clinics. This plot is just to show you that every single data point, um, so this is LA in our context, it's geotagged, we have a GPS location and the fine time series of the personal PM 2.5 data that we're collecting. And so we take these measurements, we do additional modeling on top of the, or based on the locations where these people, these kids have visited. And we are starting to see, this is a paper that we published last year, I think, or early this year, 
uh, looking at daily effects, we're starting to see daily acute effects of outdoor and traffic related air pollutants. So in this case, it's ozone is negatively associated with morning FEV1 lung function in these kids being decreased. Similarly, we're seeing some of these traffic related pollutants that we model using dispersion models being associated with lower peak expiratory flow in these kids again. And so UC, Roxana, and Hua are now working on the next level analysis where actually we're starting to see effects at the hourly level um, with, with the rescue inhaler outcomes. But just to show you that we can actually start to understand relationships at this level with these kinds of tools. Wrapping up, I promise, but um, you know, what's next? What can these methods allow us to do? They can really help us design very context sensitive data collection. So for example, in prisons, what we did is, again, applied these peak detection algorithms. And when a peak is detected, less than a minute later, we can trigger this EMA phone survey to ask, what were you next to? You know, was it cigarette smoking? Was it traffic? Were you in a parking lot, etc.? That is allowing us to do source apportionment in a way more time resolved fashion. Still in you know, early phases, I think, but that's the potential really is that you can actually ask specific questions around certain events of interest to get more information about them. You can also go a step further and do these sort of geo-adaptive and contextually aware smart interventions so this is a really nice figure from Yang and Jankowska that I love and I always show. Let's say you're trying to intervene on kind of healthy eating behavior and you know there's a source of junk food you know, right here and the person is passing through. You could alert them just based on how close they are or if they spent, let's say, a lot of time in that vicinity of that, that outlet to kind of avoid you know, to try to intervene to make them avoid that exposure, right? But if you use all this kind of contextual information in real time and look at the speed they're going and maybe, you know, they're in a car, maybe the direction they're driving away from that, or maybe they just happen to be stopping at a light and that's why, you know, they seem to be spending more time here, then you can be more smart and not trigger that warning or intervention and sort of not burden your participant and hopefully be able to design more clever interventions that actually do change health behaviors. So this is, I don't think as pie in the sky as it might seem these days, but of course these studies are complicated, but that's the actual potential of what we can do. Okay, I think I'm going to skip over this just to leave some room for questions. I'm sorry, I'm going so quickly. Um, but, you know, I've learned a lot doing these kind of two types of deployments, the classic and the novel. They're different in very important ways that we need to think about if we're going to do these kinds of studies. And I'm happy to share my slides with you all and talk about this later. But just to conclude, I hope I've shown you how advances in personal monitoring capabilities are really allowing us to do this kind of work at scale and to get really highly personalized and resolved exposure assessments within actual activity spaces. The hope is that this will let us kind of incorporate more information about the individual, understand sources and mixtures and reduce exposure measurement error in our studies, but also it's moving us closer to this precision health risk communication paradigm and of course, all of this comes with very important privacy and ethical considerations that we probably need another day to talk through, um, but I'm sure you all appreciate. And so that said, I want to thank all my wonderful mentees and collaborators and funding sources. This is my contact information. Again, please don't hesitate. I do want to put in a plug, hopefully you've all seen this, but the NIEHS is organizing a workshop series to really kind of push exposomics more into action. Uh, we're calling it the Accelerating Precision Environmental Health, demonstrating the value of the exposome series. It starts July 22nd and it's a few different Um, so if you haven't seen it yet, I'm happy to time and attention. I hope I didn't exhaust you and I'm happy to take questions. Fantastic. Thank you. Wow. Uh, there's so much data here. 
and such a uh, you did an excellent job of giving us like a bird's eye view of what you're working on. Thank you, Rima. I think I just froze. Thank you. Thank you. And I think my internet is. Can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay. And it might be mine too. I, I feel like there's some freezing. Um, fantastic. I, it's as yeah, although you're presenting so much data, I almost was like, well, what about adding this and adding more, like uh, mental health and stress with the pregnancy? So I'm I'm wondering. Uh, I bet you get lots of additional questions on what else can you add? What else can we pile on uh, to the the data that you're collecting? Um, but I guess my, my main, I guess the big question is how are all of these data, what infrastructure do you have and use to house the data and then training needed for this next generation uh, to, you know, take on the, take on this data. There's some informatics that um, is typically not in an environmental health science program. So I'm interested in the informatics component and then the, the training for the next generation. Completely agree with you, Erin, and thank you so much. Um, you know, in some of these deployments, we are actually collecting stress and other health outcomes okay, information, good. but kind of too much to try to also fit in here. Uh, and I'm happy to talk about these, of course. I think you're so right though, the infrastructure. Yeah. So the more classic kind of realm where you might design a data collection protocol and test it and deploy it exactly the same way you designed it, right? I think, you know, that involves just pre-planning and mapping for the devices and the tools you need and the, you know, the software, the phones, the data storage, all that. But when you get into the informatics realm, that's a whole new ball game. And, you know, everything is always changing on you while you're trying to do the study. So it's almost like we have to shift our mentality into this more dynamic world to assume anyway that the software will change and the sensors will change and everything will change. So how do we design a study where we are minimizing bias to the data collection as much as possible? But the reality is, I mean, that PRISM Center was three large projects out of UCLA. I led the third project, which was the kind of the deployment and the helping the design from my point of view from environmental health, right? One project was the computer science and the engineering. Another project was the informatics and the kind of making all the data streams work and connect, building the apps, the visualizations, et cetera. And then there was sort of my expertise and my teams in terms of what do we need to collect to understand asthma and air pollution and blah, blah, blah. So you're right that we're not taught these things, you know, in environmental health. I think the to hopefully keep it short, but um, I think the biggest thing we can be training our trainees is just to learn to sort of think in more multidisciplinary ways. And I know that's a cliche that we always say, right? But learn to understand other domains languages and learn how other people think in their fields so that you can talk to each other and make things happen. Because I'm not going to become the computer science or engineer you know, expert, and there's no way I can do that, right? But I need to know how to work in that kind of world and team now. So yeah, I mean, there's so much to say, obviously, but um, I, just want to, I want to leave room for more questions if possible, but I'm happy to share. Uh, are there any other questions coming in. I, I see people asking if uh, you can, if they can work with you, um, and I'm sure you would be welcome to it, but yet you're, I'm sure your time is also limited, but I do encourage everyone to reach out um, to Rima uh, later with additional questions and um, possible collaboration, especially with the new climate RFAs all out there. I'm sure you'll be very busy very soon. <laughs> completely agree but thank you so much all i really appreciate this opportunity and please do reach out anytime great thank you everyone for joining thank you rima thanks for having me bye fantastic